Good morning. I want to welcome each of you to our Bethany Church worship service. It's so good to see each one of you. And I don't think we'll ever take for granted being able to join together uh, to worship the Lord, especially after going through the months of uh, not being able to be here together during the pandemic. So uh, we just have an extra appreciation for seeing each other's faces this morning. And we also want to welcome those of you that are joining us by Zoom. We want to welcome um, each of our guests and visitors, either here in person or by Zoom. Uh, Psalm 118.24 says, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice together and be glad in it. Um, at this time, do we have any sharing, um, any praise reports or prayer requests? Sugumi. Uh, as I mentioned about my friend Tammy, um, so pneumonia gone. And then now she's back to um, leukemia treatment uh, by same doctor as Maurice's, oh. Dr. Gupta. Yeah, so she is attacking the main uh, pneumonia, not the pneumonia, leukemia. So yeah, hopefully, but two more years until 2023, she has uh, outpatient um, therapy. So. But thank you very much for praying for her and uh, herself, her family, her parents. They are so um, happy. Um, and then uh, just uh, praise the Lord. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sugumi. You know, as Christians and as believers, um, one of our most important responsibilities, and it's one that all of us share together, we're actively involved in it is uh, prayer for others and uh, you know we we just can't underestimate uh, intercessory prayer so our praise and worship and our and our prayer to the Lord when we pray together like this it's not going up it's each one of our your prayers in agreement uh, that go up to the Lord and he hears every one of them I think what's really unfortunate is uh, there are people out there Nobody is praying for, and that's the sad thing. But as a Bethany family, what a blessing it is when we can support each other in prayer. Are there any other sharing? Any prayer requests? Okay. We do want to pray for uh, Pastor... Chuck and Jan, and for Bob and Agnes, uh, this, this coming week is the annual Mount Hermon GEMS Conference, and so uh, Bob and Agnes have already left. It starts today, and uh, Chuck and Jan will be leaving right after the service, so we want to pray for them. At this time, let's uh, join our hearts together, and, uh, and we'll all intercede for each other and for Bethany, um, and what a blessing it is to be able to do that. Father in heaven, we worship and praise you this morning. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the privilege and responsibility of supporting each other in prayer. We pray for your healing power to bless, strengthen, comfort, and heal each person on our prayer list. And we thank you for the answers to prayer. It's such a blessing when we hear the testimonies of uh, those that um, are doing better as a result of um, our uh, lifting up our prayers for them. We pray for your blessing and provision for the Global School of Sports Ministry and healing for their director, Alyssa Carr Mahone. We pray for your blessings and safekeeping on Pastor Chuck and Jan and on Bob and Agnes 
as they attend the GEMS Mount Hermon Conference this week. We ask your blessings on the tithes and offerings brought to you, and we ask your blessing on each giver. We pray for your anointing on our praise team and on Pastor Chuck as he shares with us a message that you have given him. We love you, we bless you, and thank you for who you are, our creator and sustainer, our Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, we, um, Jan would like to come up and just share with us uh, what's going on with uh, Global Sports Ministry. Well, this is pretty exciting because it goes right into what Steve was saying about intercessory prayers. And I got so excited when we got the latest um, prayer letter or news brief, she calls it, that um, Alyssa writes about the Global um, School of Sports Ministry. And I just wanted to share with you because it's so exciting. And since we're involved in giving and praying, I wanted you all to be able to hear it. They had a five-day um, Easter outreach where they sent in a team into you, a um, part of Uganda. And over those five days, they did lots of different things. One was community service where they picked up trash and they cut brush, brushes down, bushes down and stuff. And during that time, because of their servant's heart, two people accepted the Lord just from seeing that. And then the team put on youth soccer clinics. And <laughs> this is so amazing. During that time, 81 kids gave their lives to the Lord. Then, <laughs> um, after all of that, and God was really blessing, they were, they were um, not physically attacked, but verbally attacked by the Catholic Church, telling them that they were bringing the wrong message and they were, um, they were causing danger in their community and they wanted them to leave. Well, <laughs> during that interaction, two of the Catholic people accepted the Lord. <laughs> I mean, you can't, when God is in it, you cannot <laughs> fight against that. So over the course of five days, 42 more kids were redeemed during the matches that they had. And then they had a video program in the evening, but it wasn't well attended, she says, because of COVID. Um, but during that time, 19 people came to the Lord. This is like so shocking to me because Chuck and I in Japan, we just never saw anything like this. It's so unbelievable. And then they passed out family and children gift packs and distributed those. And um, people were just so impressed with their generosity that 15 more people came to the Lord. <laughs> so their, their final thing that they were going to do was an Easter luncheon. And the Catholics were fighting against them. And there was a big storm that was supposed to come and they figured it would ruin the lunch. And they all prayed and God took away all the obstacles, the rain didn't come, and <laughs> there were over 300 people that came. They had only prepared for 250, but God provided enough food for all of them. Yes, so all in all, in those five days, there were 161 people that accepted the Lord. I mean, that, that is just so amazing. And so she, she says in this letter, please thank people that have been praying and giving towards this ministry because God is working. So I just 
praise the Lord that we can be a part of it. So thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jan. That's pretty exciting. That sounds like a foretaste of when the worldwide revival happens before the coming of the Lord. I think, you know, we hear about, you know, every church is going to be busting at the seams and uh, there'll be churches, you know, uh, services going on in the sports stadiums. And, um, you know, it's just uh, that that just gives us a little bit of confirmation about that. So we're excited to, to hear about that. Uh, as the uh, praise worship team comes forward, uh, we'd like to just have a short time of uh, greeting those that are next to you, and uh, uh, not 15 minutes, just a short time, so uh, please greet those around you. All right, if you're already standing, you can stay standing, or if you want to sit, you can sit. We want to just prepare our hearts for worship as this song, Come, Now is the Time to Worship. It's always, it's always the time to worship. And it also says, just as you are. You know, the Lord wants you to just come as you are and worship him in spirit and in truth. So let's sing, Come, Now is the Time to Worship.
just as you are. Hey. All right, another long time familiar one. As the deer pants for the water, as today we're talking about anger and I think no better way to get rid of anger than to just focus on the Lord and worship him and thirst for time with the Lord. So we'll sing the first verse in English and then the second in Japanese and then the third verse in English. your heart's desire just to worship the Lord and focus on him today and now we'll just go right into I stand in awe for the Lord is beautiful beyond description Stand, I stand. 
stand in awe of you because you are beautiful beyond description you are marvelous beyond description lord who can grasp your love and your grace and your mercy but we we will try and we worship you today in jesus name we pray amen Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are, offered, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come offer your gift. Bless the reading of the word. All right. Thank you, Alexi. Pulling double duty today in the sound room and reading up front. Appreciate it. Are you angry? Is anyone angry or everybody good? If, you, if you're not angry, I guess I don't have to give the message, but maybe you know somebody who's angry. Um, and as we read in these verses, where I have it underlined, it says, we'll be liable. This Greek word is sometimes translated in danger of or guilty of or answerable to. So the idea is that you're 
you're in danger of judgment, you're, you're liable for what you're saying, it'll be judged. And so some translations just say you are guilty, uh, but it, it really means that you, you may be guilty is the idea. And then uh, some translations put the actual Greek word like this, raka, whoever calls his brother raka, and that raka, it literally means good for nothing or worthless. And the word for fool is, Greek word is moros, which we get our word, you may have guessed, moron. So um, I'm, I'm sure you've never called anyone a moron. Um, but basically, when you think about it, when you say, raka, that person's worthless, you're actually saying that they have no value God made a mistake. God made something of no value. Jesus died for them, didn't die for them because they have no value. And it's like saying, I wish you didn't exist. And I think that's where Jesus makes the connection with murder. If you wish someone didn't exist or feel that they're just taking up space on the planet Earth, then really you are murdering them in your heart. But this word is used, this uh, moros, fool, is used in other places, and so it depends on the context. If you're warning someone about being foolish, then it's not a sin, because Jesus even warned the Pharisees that they were being foolish and blind, and he used this word. And he was warning them. He was trying to warn them that their teaching was foolish, and they were missing the real point of the gospel. And I think it's interesting that the words, the, the verse that comes after this, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go, first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So. It's pretty easy to know if your brother has something against you. First, when I just read through this, I said, well, I may not know that my brother has something against me. But given the context of the verses before, if I've called my brother worthless moron, then I probably know that he has something against me. Or if he's called me a worthless moron, then I know that he has something against me. So I think there's a connection here where if you get into a name calling incident with someone else, you know that there's some resentment and you need to go to that brother. And I've talked about reconciliation in the past, and so I'm not gonna focus as much, but I'll do a little review today on reconciliation, but I mainly wanna talk about anger and what causes it, what is it, and how do we cure it? So, first of all, what is anger? Have you ever thought about that? <clears throat> By the way, I did put a little insert in your uh, bulletins today. You can fill in the blanks if you like, and I hope I'm not giving too much information. If there's too much or stuff you already know, you know, just kind of gloss over that, and hopefully you'll get something new out of this. But one author of a counseling book that I have defines anger as a powerful emotion that's God-given, and it can range from mild frustration to severe fury or hostility. And then another book uh, called The Anger Trap defines it as a emotion of self-preservation. It's a response to a perceived uh, threat or invalidation. So a physical threat, you know, we know what a physical threat is, but sometimes it's a, just a verbal threat or an invalidation where someone calls you worthless. That's, that fits into the invalidation. Or someone challenges your belief system or challenges what you did. It's an invalidation that causes anger. But some truths about anger 
Anger itself is not a sin, and you probably know this. It says, in your anger, be angry and do not sin, from Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So we can be angry and not sin. Even Jesus showed anger. If you remember when he was um, asked to heal somebody on the Sabbath and the Pharisees were all challenging him and he looked at them with anger because they didn't want this person to be healed on the Sabbath. And it says he looked at them with anger and he was grieved at their hardness of heart and he said to them, stretch out your hand, to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and he was restored. <clears throat> and then the anger went to the Pharisees because they felt invalidated. So another definition is that anger is a state of readiness. And it's just, it's a natural response to a perceived threat or injustice. Anger's mentioned 500 times in the Bible. The only, the only emotion mentioned more than anger is love. And it can, be a, it can be a primary or secondary emotion. What I mean by that is if someone makes fun of you in front of a group, insults you in front of your friends, you'll initially be hurt. And then later on, it'll turn, it may turn to anger. Or sometimes we have grief when we've lost someone and we, we first go the, through the grieving process and then sometimes that grief turns to anger. And then another truth that I have learned over the years is the person that angers you controls you. If someone can just get your goat all the time, they really have control over you. They're controlling your joy. They're controlling your mood. They may be, even be controlling where you go. You, you will just avoid going wherever that person is. And so we don't want to let people control us by being able to get us angry. So my question is, are you angry? Uh, here's, here's a little test. Um, well, first of all, um, some emotional symptoms of anger or bitterness. Maybe you're thinking someone is worthless or a moron. You know. uh, maybe you're separating from someone. You're just avoiding someone. Or maybe you're gossiping about someone incessantly saying negative things about somebody, or maybe you're using critical, sarcastic words about someone, or you're just kind of being mean-spirited, um, impatient, lacking love, unforgiving. Those are some self-tests we can do to see if we have some anger. Now, there's also physical symptoms. If you're chronically angry, you may develop some of these symptoms. Headaches, ulcers, stomach cramps, high blood pressure, colitis, digestive problems, and heart condition. Now, I'm not saying if you have any of these, doesn't mean you're an angry person, but if you, if you have several of these, it might be pointing to some suppressed anger. So, how angry are you? Uh, you probably haven't thought about the levels of anger that you might see. But the first level is just irritation. You know, it's kind of like a stone in your shoe or Paul talked about the thorn in his flesh. And it's just something bugs you. But, um, you know, like a mosquito that's always buzzing around. It's an irritation. But then it, the next level is indignation. That's where you feel you've been wronged. There's been an injustice. This isn't fair. And you get indignation. The next level is wrath. And I would have thought this was the, 
the last level, wrath, this strong desire for revenge. But there's another level above that, that's fury. This is where you partially lose your emotional control. You'll see this in TV shows, you know, where people are yelling and screaming at each other, throwing things, punching the wall. That's the fury stage. But there's even a stage above that, rage. And this is where you have loss of control and it results in aggression and acts of violence, hitting people, destroying property, and even shooting people. And the last level is hostility. It's just a chronic form of anger, and this is what you would see in people who have done these mass shootings lately. And so often it's people shooting their coworkers. They get so angry, and it just builds up and builds up over weeks or months or years and they finally just reach this level of hostility and they explode into violence. <clears throat> so, why, why are you angry? Why do we get angry? As I mentioned before, there's perceived threats. It might be a threat of physical assault or verbal assault, maybe it's sexual harassment, intimidation or manipulation or betrayal. You feel like someone has betrayed you. But then there's also the invalidation that I, that I spoke of. And this is where you're insulted, criticized, um, humiliated. Some people get angry just losing a game um, or a contest or a sporting event. Uh, I used, to, I used to get so angry over uh, my home team losing a football game sometime, you know, it, that I almost felt like I had to give up watching football. <laughs> Especially, I won't mention Alabama. But, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, some people like to rub it into each other about sporting events and things. and. Uh, and you can take that as a perceived invalidation. You know, it's, it's kind of silly. We think, well, if my team does good, you know, that that lifts me up somehow. Like, you know, wh whether Ohio State wins or loses, my value has not changed one iota. And uh, yet we, we kind of act like that, like when our team is the best, that we're the best. But it's not so. Um, but... Uh, an example of these two kinds of anger was graphically seen in the news recently when the uh, family was driving on 101 freeway and this woman was cut off by somebody. So she got angry. She saw it as a perceived threat to her safety, the way this person was driving. So she made an obscene gesture in anger and that car pulled back out into the other lane, came back behind her, and they had anger, feeling invalidated. This person made an obscene gesture at me, and so I've been invalidated, and they pulled out a gun and shot into the car, and it killed the child in the back seat. That's a terrible example of what anger can lead to, the perceived threat, and then the perceived invalidation. <clears throat> On the lighter side of uh, driving on the freeway, I thought I needed to break the tension a little bit. Did you hear about the guy who was driving on the freeway and his wife called him up and said, I know you're coming home from work now and I just heard on the radio there's some crazy guy driving the wrong way on the freeway, be careful. And the husband says, one crazy guy, everybody's driving the wrong way on the freeway. And, <laughs> You probably heard that one, but <clears throat> just thought I'd throw a little levity in. Uh, so some other reasons we get angry are when we observe immoral or unlawful acts. And this is natural. I mean, this is what Jesus got angry about when he saw people treating others unfairly or not wanting a person to be healed on the Sabbath. Um, 
and then observing real or perceived injustices to others, like uh, injustice in the government or a court decision that you feel is in unjust or just the way people are treated at the workplace, maybe you feel it's unjust or that some billionaires are not paying any taxes, um, those kinds of injustices. And I got thinking about whenever a bill comes before Congress and um, I know we're not gonna talk about politics, I'm not gonna mention any bill, you can pick any bill that's out there right now and every one I thought of, one, one group of people sees it as correcting an injustice or a danger, and the other people see it as a um, threat to their freedom or their way of doing life and see it as a betrayal. And so both sides are getting anger from a different point of view seeing something as an injustice or seeing something as a threat. Then uh, when we have this kind of a struggle, especially about stuff we're watching on TV, stuff that we have no control over, I think it's good to remember the serenity prayer. And this prayer has been modified through the years, but um, it's credited to originally coming from uh, Reinhold Niebuhr. And this is pretty much the original prayer that he, he put together. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So a lot of our anger can be just be cured by uh, remembering this prayer and praying this prayer. And then there's, there's also things um, that are totally unrelated to emotions that might cause anger, just health issues. If we have uh, diabetes or some other chronic illness, it's just gonna, gonna wear us down and that can, that can lead to some anger. Or if our medications are off, um, too much caffeine or other stimulants, things like that can also set us off. And then the other thing that we need to be aware of, and we've talked about a little bit in the past messages where we talked about the self-inventory, but you may have suffered a traumatic event in the past. You may have PTSD from anything from a childhood abuse to being in a war situation to being in an awful accident or seeing a, an awful accident like the people that saw that tragedy in uh, Miami with the hotel. I mean, it, those people have PTSD and that's going to cause anger as well. And that kind of thing, you need to meet, need to meet with a counselor and therapist to process those memories. Um, but some of the ways we deal with anger, there's healthy ways which are not sinful and then there's unhealthy ways that are sinful, and that's what Jesus was getting at, these unhealthy ways of dealing with anger. And the first is just openly being aggressive in your actions, whether it's being loud or blunt, forceful, opinionated, you know, griping, complaining, swearing, insulting, um, pushing, shoving, uh, interrupting people. These are all aggressive behaviors of anger now, I would rarely see this in Japan. I mean, it, once in a while we saw somebody get openly aggressive in anger, but usually it's one of these other two, repressing the anger, which is basically denying it. Right? What, me angry? I'm not angry, nothing bothers me, you know? And then there's also <laughs> suppressing anger now, the difference between repressing and suppressing, repression is really denying it. You know, I'm not angry, you know, even though they tried to kill me, I'm not angry. Um, but suppressing is you acknowledge that you're angry, whatever somebody did made you angry, 
but you're going to try and either kill the pain with alcohol or drugs or eating a, two boxes of chocolate or something, um, or you're just going to uh, you're going to try to bury it, and this is when you start getting into being a cynical or having passive aggressive anger. So, at the risk of giving you too much information, I'll give you more information about some signs that you might be in denial. Um, if you're refusing to expose personal problems or need, and I'd also like you to think about maybe there's some difficult people in your life, because um, I feel like I'm probably speaking to the choir a lot. You know, I certainly don't see a displays of anger here, but I'm sure many of you have family members who are struggling with anger or friends or neighbors. But some of the signs that people are suppressing anger is they don't want to talk about personal problems. They want to appear like they have everything together and they don't want to really share how they are. They shy away from talking about controversial topics and they make excuses for when someone has wronged them. And they might be a people pleaser. And, uh, you know, just, just one of these doesn't mean, oh, this person's got an anger problem. But think about if a person displays a lot of these um, symptoms, then they may, and here's five more, your second guess, your own good judgment, you let frustrations pass without um, saying anything, you refuse to let others help you even when you really need it, you pretend to be not resentful, but you really are resentful, and or you pretend to be a pleasant person, but you don't really feel like <laughs> being a pleasant person. Uh, so these are signs that you're suppressing anger. And then you may have someone in your life who is displaying passive aggressive anger. And again, I apologize for uh, throwing all this out there, but just maybe something, something will be uh, helpful for helping you to see when you're dealing with someone with passive aggressive anger. One of the most common, and I'm, I've been guilty of this one, um, when you give people a silent treatment. <laughs> Jan doesn't look surprised. <laughs> so, <laughs> but if your spouse just all of a sudden stops talking to you for three days, then you can assume maybe there's some passive aggressive anger here. Um, or making lame excuses and avoiding doing things that you don't want to do. Um, and you may have had employees or coworkers like this. They procrastinate and they're just chronically forgetful. You know, a lot of times this is a purposeful, aggressive way to get revenge. Passive, aggressive anger is really a passive way to get revenge with somebody. And saying yes and then not following through. Um, doing tasks in your own way, in your own time, despite what other people want. Or complaining a lot about people behind their backs. Or saying what other person wants to hear and then doing whatever you want. Uh, being evasive so that you can't be controlled. Uh, I remember seeing that sometimes at, at work. You know, you try to pin a person down. Well, when can you actually work on this? Well, I might be available a week from Tuesday, but then, oh, I've got a funeral to go to. Uh, you know, so people, people will just keep moving around to where you can't can't pin them down, or giving a half-hearted effort, or having the reputation of being unreliable, or being wasteful, 
um, even when others are trying to get you to be conscientious. Uh, so like a passive aggressive spouse might just leave the lights on, you know, just, just to irritate you. It's just any little thing that is done to irritate another is like a passive aggressive. So finally, the good news, how to have healthy expressions of anger. So I know that you all get angry at times and there are ways to be angry and not sin. And that's what I want to finish with, with, uh, non-sinful, healthy expressions of anger. First one is delay your expression of anger. You've heard about taking a time out. And Psalm 1911 says, good sense makes one slow to anger and it is his glory to overlook an offense. So the other two, and I'm going to a little detail on each of these be gently assertive. So assertive is much different than aggressive. Assertive means standing up for yourself, but doing it in a gentle way. And then choosing to release your anger. So just want to look at a few ways that you can delay your anger Take a time out, um, just take a walk, do some exercise. Another thing that's helpful is to write down what's making you angry. Just jot it down, but keep it private. Don't give it to anyone, and probably the next day you'll just rip it up and throw it away. Uh, talk with someone but not just to vent or gossip, but to get constructive advice. Should I be angry about this? Or maybe did I contribute to this? Um, have, am I just being in too, uh, too sensitive, thin skin? You know, get, get some other person's uh, perspective. And of course, pray. Pray for insight and wisdom. And do something that calms you down. Uh, one of the things I do is uh, I'll play guitar or listen to music, read, read comics or a joke book, watch, watch funny videos. Um, these are ways you can delay anger. And, of course, you need to just think about it. What should, is this something I should just let go? Is this something I need to be assertive, which is the next step? The gently assertive is something that I cover in um, marital counseling because couples need to be gently assertive with each other and let each other know what uh, is on their mind and what their, what their desires are. So when you're calmly assertive, you calmly state your concern or your proposal or your ideas. And you say, you know, I really wish we could go out to dinner more than once a year, dear, you know. And then, um, state it gently. You never take me out, you know. Um, stand firm for your right beliefs and personal convictions. So if someone clearly uh, lies to you or says something that's totally immoral, then stand firm, but do it in a nice way and let people know your personal limits and boundaries. You know, this is another way of saying, learn to say no. Um, we need to let people know, you know, I need some space. Um, you, are, you are encroaching on my time or my space and I need this time to do this or that. Then maintain a healthy distance when you're, when you are being gently assertive, don't get right in people's face, uh, but keep a distance, keep calm, but also empathize. Um, let me see, I gotta try not to get angry at these slides. Uh, it takes about 10 clicks to get to these slides. Um, 
have the goal to restore the relationship, not to destroy it. So that this is really important. I've talked about this in reconciliation, but um, when you're being gently assertive, you're still wanting to restore the relationship and not, not pound on people. And you want to empathize. You want to try to understand it from the other person's point of view. And then show respect for the other person, of course, is obvious. And then forgive or surrender your right for revenge. So you, you see, you can still forgive someone, but you still have to be gently assertive. You, you still, especially in a, uh, a marriage relationship, but also in, with your children, people you're living with, um, if it's a constant kind of behavior, you need to be assertive and talk about it. And uh, the last one, releasing Oh, this comes from Romans 12:9. Um, Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So really that's forgiveness, is just leaving it to God and not, not trying to get revenge and justice yourself. So the last item, releasing your anger, Remember your true value, and this is what we've had in previous messages as well. Your worth, remember your worth is not based on your achievements, or it's not based on your social status, your income, your fame, your power, your influence, your race, your nationality, how much authority you have. None of that determines your worth. You are of great value because you were created by God, and he died for you and wants you to be his child. That's what gives you value, and you have to remember that. So when you're insulted, when you're invalidated, you are still worth the same as you were before they invalidated you or insulted you or called you worthless moron. So don't waste your time trying to get everybody to respect you. It will never happen. I mean, even, even a person running for president may get millions of people that love them, but they're always going to have millions of people that can't stand them. So if you want to be loved, love others, um, and you will be loved. But you're not going to be loved by everyone. And just remember, your self-worth doesn't come from how many people love you. And remember, you're never alone. Uh, Jesus said he would never leave us or forsake us. And Isaiah 41.10 is a favorite of mine. The Lord says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And so along with that, if you want a friend, be a friend. Um, not everybody's going to want to be our friends. So don't take that as invalidation. Well, how's come? She's friends with so-and-so, but she's not my friend, you know. Not everybody's going to be friends with everybody. But if you want to be a want to have friends, then be a friend to somebody. And release, of course, release your emotional pain to Jesus from Psalm 62, 8. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. When you have that pain... Uh, when you've been invalidated, insulted, called names or whatever, release it to Jesus. And I've said this many times before, but he's the best one to vent to um, because he doesn't tell anybody else and he listens to everything we say and he's, he's just willing to be patient with us and listen to all our complaints. And so vent, vent to Jesus, pour out your heart before him, because he's a refuge for us. And so I know that was a lot of information. I hope that you mainly just think about whether you're maybe having anger issues or if you have someone in your household with anger issues that you can think about this. Um, you can get the whole printout of the message um, from the emails. 
And just remember these three things, to delay your anger, to be gently assertive, which is the opposite of being suppressing and passive aggressive, and then just release the anger to the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your example of how to be angry and not sin. Lord, help us to resolve and release our anger in healthy ways. Help us to help others. Lord, there is so much anger in the world today, so much anger in our country, so much anger in people who don't know you. And you have the answer. You can give them peace and joy and take away their anger. Lord, help us to help others to release their anger. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to worship the Lord with the favorite worship song. You know, I, I couldn't find any songs about anger. So I figured we, we just need to worship the Lord and forget about our anger. So we're going to sing Holy, Holy, Holy. If you would like to stand, I know this is a favorite. Some in the survey said, please sing holy, holy, holy once in a while. And so... Let's sing. Let's sing holy, holy, holy.
what we could ever imagine, and yet you are loving, graceful, and perfect. And we worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now, another request from the surveys was to have a different doxology once in a while. So today we're singing Grace, Love, and Fellowship. We'll sing it through one time, and then you can join us. And uh, this will be our doxology today. May the grace of Christ our Savior and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us. Okay, join us. May the grace of Christ our Savior and the love of God our and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us. One more. May the grace of Christ our Savior and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us. benediction and then we will from Hebrews chapter 13 now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant equip you with everything good that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to him be glory forever and ever Amen. Amen. Well, please join us for fellowship in the courtyard. And.